It's 9 p.m. on the East Coast of America, and live from the WACA studios, this is Good Night. We're back. Season 2 of Good Night starts right now. So what did we miss the last couple of months? Well, last week O.J. Simpson got a Twitter and told all of his followers that he's got a lot of getting even to do. And if that wasn't ominous enough, he tweeted almost 25 years to the day of the infamous murder of his wife, in the subsequent low-speed chase. He swears he plans to use his Twitter account to spread positivity, but he's not off to a very good start. His four-way into Twitter comes after a nine-year armed robbery prison sentence. I think it's safe to say the juice is loose. In other horrifying Twitter news, Bill Cosby somehow tweeted from jail to celebrate Father's Day last week. The comedian tweeted in support of fathers around the world and included a classroom lecture recorded in the 1970s regarding slavery and African-American fatherhood. The tweet ended with the hashtag far from finish. A bold thing to say for a convicted 81-year-old with nine years left on a sentence. Now it's more than likely that someone other than Bill Cosby runs this Twitter account and tweeted it for some reason but speech to text does exist. And with the picture of Cosby saying, hey, 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 into a phone while in prison, does a better job of summing up 2019 than I ever could. In more horrifying news, a recent study published in the BBC purports that younger people are growing horns in the back of their head due to increased phone usage. While the scientists that conducted the study refute the term horns, many media outlets have rolled with it. And we will too, because it's a great mix of hilarious and terrifying. The study concludes that because young people spend more time than previous generations leaning forward to look at their phones, the added stress strengthens muscles behind the spine, resulting in a growth coming from the bottom of the skull. Many in the field have been quick to refute the study, citing that there is no clear correlation between phone use and the horns, and many say that posture alone is not enough to make such a change in bone structure. But to officially test it, we had some of our crew sit down and look at their phones for a couple days. Here's the result. Pretty spectacular stuff. They'll be stuck with those horns for the rest of their lives, but sometimes you have to think of the greater good. In sports news, the Toronto Raptors won the NBA Finals for the first time in franchise history while we were on break. And Canada collectively partied, including rapper Drake, who celebrated the win with two new songs. However, it seems that nobody celebrated harder than head coach Nick Nurse, who was brought out to perform at a sold-out show in Toronto. The band in question, the famous Canadian outfit The Arkells, accompanied Nurse for a rendition of a Stevie Wonder song. Nick Nurse killed it, and on stage, despite reportedly being very nervous before going out. We have also gotten word that Brad Stevens has begun practicing the guitar in hopes that he'll get to get the opportunity to play with the Dropkick Murphys when Boston wins the championships. But with the way this offseason is going, I doubt that he'll get a chance anytime soon. In entertainment news, the new series Good Omens has caught some flack from Christian groups this week. The series follows an angel and a demon as they team up to stop the Antichrist. The website Christian Return to Order put forth a petition demanding Netflix remove the show, citing its banal deception of Satanism, the fact that God is voiced by a woman, and other things that really just don't matter, because it's a TV show. The petition amassed over 20,000 signatures and drew a few eyeballs, including that of Netflix itself. The only issue is that you can't watch Good Omens on Netflix because it's not a Netflix show. It's an Amazon original series. The Netflix and Amazon Twitter accounts had some banter back and forth celebrating the hilarity of the petition, and even screenwriter Neil Gaiman chimed in after being left out of the conversation entirely and wanting some streaming numbers of their own. We're being told that Hulu has commissioned a sequel to The Passion of the Christ, starring Tyler Perry as Jesus. We'll see how that one shakes out. Marvel's tentpole film Avengers Endgame is still in theaters, and it currently sits at number two 
as the highest grossing film of all time, just $44 million shy of Avatar, which has sat at number one since 2009. Projection shows that M-Game will not be able to eclipse Avatar, but Disney CEO Kevin Feige has an idea for the final push. In a press tour for the new Spider-Man movie, Fahey stated that Endgame is adding some deleted scenes at the end of the film. It's an interesting proposition, but I'm sure Marvel diehards have already bought their tickets, but with the film's three-hour runtime, it might not be the push for everyone that they think it is. Regardless of whether or not Endgame reaches the number one spot, it's really no skin off of Disney's back. With the recent acquisition of Fox, they now own four of the five highest grossing films of all time, including Avatar. Thanos might be the Avengers' greatest enemy, but it seems he's got nothing on Mickey Mouse. And finally, in ridiculous news, Japanese transit officials have solved a mystery that left passengers stranded on routine commuter trains. In May, 30 trains stopped inadvertently due to an electrical malfunction. The electrical malfunction was later found to be a slug who crawled inside a fuse box. Unfortunately, this story does not have a happy ending. According to the BBC, its electrocuted remains were found lodged inside equipment next to the tracks. Rest in peace, Japanese train slug. We're going to kick off one of our new segments, introducing Lucy Burge with This Week in Music History. And when we come back, We'll have some more new stuff for you. Keep it locked here, right here on Good Night. This is Lucy Burge with Good Night's This Week in Music History. We begin this week in 1966 when the Rolling Stones kicked off their fifth North American tour right here in Massachusetts in Lynn at the Manning Bowl after holding a press conference announcement on a yacht in New York City. Where else would the Rolling Stones do that? In 1967, Procol Harum's hit A Whiter Shade of Pale entered the Billboard chart where it would peak at number five. Awesome song, huge hit for them. In 1968, Elvis appeared on an NBC TV show that was promoted as his comeback special. He wore black leather and played a lot of his early hits. Uh, then also this week in 1977, Elvis made his last ever live stage appearance when he appeared at the Market Square Arena in Indianapolis. He died a couple months after that. In 1974, Sonny and Cher got divorced after they were married for 10 years. And in 1975, Alice Cooper fell from the stage and broke six ribs during his Welcome to My Nightmare tour in Vancouver, Canada. And not great for him. In 1984, Prince released Purple Rain, his sixth studio album, of course. In 1994, Aerosmith became the first major band to let fans download a full new track free from the internet. Kind of a new thing back then. Also in 1994, the Beastie Boys were number one on the US album chart with To The Five Burrows. And our biggest thing to happen this week, arguably, in 2009, Michael Jackson died this week at the age of 50 after suffering heart failure at his home in Beverly Hills. This has been Lucy Burge with This Week in Music History. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Lucille Burge at both of those. Five. What happened to four? Got an exciting new segment here, the top trending items on Twitter. Let's introduce our panel here tonight. We've got a distinguished panel. We have Samson Rachapi, who's so straight he's throwing his own parade. Brennan Marlow, who's joining us tonight because Bernie Sanders hasn't paid off his student loan debt. John Kerwin, the only more opinionated person in America than President Trump. And the body double for Mr. Clean, Todd Carter, joins us here tonight. Welcome, guys. Thanks for being part of the inaugural panel on Good Night for the top uh, things trending on Twitter. So let's go right to the videotape and let's talk about our first item on Twitter tonight. And that would be awkward questions to ask couples. 
Mr. Clean Stunt Double over there, Todd Carter, let's start with you. You're going to get married pretty soon. Uh, awkward questions to ask couples. When are you getting married? Okay. Is that an awkward That's, question? Sometimes. It comes up a, a couple of times and it's a, it's a little awkward to, you know, do that because sometimes you aren't inviting someone to the wedding and you don't really want to tell them when it is. Samson, as the organizer for the, what is the name of the parade? Uh, this, I'm the organizer for the Super Happy Fun American Straight Pride Parade that's happening here in Boston. So the awkward questions ask couples, you would probably be an expert on this one. Jeez, what is this, like the third or fourth uh, mate you've had in the past month? <laughs> John, John Kerwin, been married a long time. Awkward questions. When are you having kids? There you go. That's a good one. That's a good one. You have to get back you get, from the honeymoon. Are they asking nine months from now? You getting that already, Todd? Yeah. And got to wait a little bit. We got to get married first. I think. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Brennan, you're still single, right? Yeah. You might be the smartest guy on the panel then. All right. Uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think? What do you hear from your friends? Say, uh, how was the first date? <laughs> oh, how was the first date? Now, is your generation still dating or are they still going out in the groups? Uh, I think it's a bit of both, but probably more groups, I'd say. It is probably more groups? Yeah. And what, do you guys just feel more comfortable? Or? I guess I do, because mostly, mostly kids of my generation are probably like, or younger, are probably just like uh, out partying and stuff like that, or going to clubs and nightclubs and all that. Now, is it safe for me to tell the entire internet here that you're available? Oh, sure, go ahead. Okay, all right. Available so if anybody's else. interested in contest they can show, we'll get to <laughs> Brennan's uh, information. What else, Todd? Well, let's jump over to the next segment and see what else we have. All right, let's well, see. Wait, 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 wait. we got one more awkward question. All right, let's do you it. Ready? You ask a newly married couple, is this a lifelong commitment or should marriage really be a 25-year contract? <laughs> <laughs> and you would answer that how? Uh, lifelong commitment. Your wife's watching. No, she's not. 25-year <laughs> con 25 con renewable contract. Renewable contract. I like it. All right, let's go to the studio and let's come up with our next question trending on Twitter. Number three trending on Twitter, Bo Jackson. John, we'll start with you. He's a big sports if Yeah, if but I looked this up. He hasn't tweeted anything in like a couple of weeks. Nobody knows why he's, nobody knows why he's trending. It might have something to do. He's doing a lot of work down in Alabama with the, uh, the, uh, the tornadoes, but... Um, I don't know why he's trending. Yeah. Great athlete, right? Was well, a great athlete. Now you had mentioned uh, Xbox games, right, uh, Todd? Yep. I was saying uh, Brennan and I's generation, we're starting to get back into what we call the retro games. And mm -hmm. back in the day, Bo Jackson, you could run around the field, run out a whole quarter, and then score a touchdown at the end of the game and, and win it. That really hurt, Todd. That, that was, really hurt. That really hurt, okay? You know, I know I'm old, but come on. You're going to say Bo Jackson is retro now. Okay. Remember his Nike commercials? Oh, yeah. Bo knows. Bo knows. Bo knows. Made some great... Who did he play for? He played for the Raiders and the Kansas City Royals. Royals and the White Sox. And the, yep. Played for the White Sox for a while. I um, mean, if you ever do a Google search of Bo Jackson highlights, I mean, it's amazing some of the catches that he made in the outfield and everything. But you know he struck out a lot? He did, yeah. He yeah. struck out an awful lot. Did you ever lot. see him when he breaks the bat oh, over yeah. his, leg? his leg? But why is Bo Jackson the number three trending thing on Twitter today? It shows you the power of Twitter. Yeah, we don't... I, I couldn't figure it out. Can't figure it out. Did, it didn't up. somebody ask the question about if there was some sort of athlete that should be receiving some sort of modern award or accolades right now, who would that be? And somebody suggested it was Bo Jackson. I mean, I, that's, I think it was something along those lines. There was a question out there. You know, if, if you could see somebody's whole career, they never got hurt, who would you? Right. Who would Jackson was one, Bob. You always another one. And yeah, if he, had, he, had, he had to have his hip replaced, actually, right? Yeah. yeah. So he yeah, definitely would have been. It was a freak accident. Did you ever see the, uh, the video when he no. got hit? He, he, he kind of, he was running and he got tackled and he tried to get an extra couple of yards and they, they had him by his ankles and he just, he pulled, it, pulled it right out of his hip. Wow. wow. Well, could have been. Well, could have been. All right, well, Bo. Best running back I ever saw. Best running, you're going to stand by that statement? Really? He was the best running Better back. Better than Barry Sanders, Walter Payton, Jim he, Brown? He, he, had, he had speed, power, agility. He just had it all. He didn't play long enough, that's all. Yeah, it was fun to watch. All right, Bo. Bo knows. We don't know why he's trending, but Bo knows. Let's go to the studio. What's our next topic? Cancel oh. student oh. debt. Brace for impact. Oh. The internet. John Kerwin's going to have some uh, strong opinions on this one. This is complete lunacy. This is complete lunacy. And you know, think of, think of the downstream effects here, right? Downstream effects is they want to tax Wall Street. So what's going to happen? The market's going to crash, right? The problem isn't. The debt. 
I mean, it, it's a problem because yeah, it's crushing student debt. The, the root of the problem is what Bernie Sanders doesn't want to go after, what the, the folks running with all this. You know, let me take a step back. Barack Obama, you have to give him a lot of credit. He kept all these lunatics on the wraps for eight years. Right? And then he leaves and they all come out and it's like, oh my God, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> I figure if we're going to be doing crazy stuff like canceling student loan debt, why don't we do automobile debt, uh, mortgage debt? Why don't we just cancel all the? I mean, if we're just playing with funny money and we're yeah. going to pretend that none of these things really matter, why don't we just completely cancel all the debts that are out there? I mean, it will be great for the economy, won't it? Well, I was always taught nothing is free. Nothing is free. Even a hard time is not free. So let's talk to the recent college graduate, Todd. Do you, I mean, not to get you personal, but do you have student loan debt? Uh, not really. I got Good a full you. boat ride to Framingham State, and that's why I ended up choosing it. I had offers to go to places like Bentley mm -hmm. uh, and Bryant University for business, and that would look really good. But I thought, you know what? The smarter thing to do is go to a place like Framingham State, and then when I go and do a graduate's degree or something, I can go to a Bentley or a Bryant. Now, what about you, Brennan? You recently graduated, class yeah. of 2017, as he proudly wears on his T-shirt. Oh, you yeah. have student loan debt. Yeah, I do. Um, I have about like 12,000 in student loan do debt. Do you feel like yeah. you were misled? Uh, I mean, a little bit. I mean, I sort of expected of uh, being debt because everyone going forward who goes to college had debt as well. But I, I did the same thing as Todd. I was like, you know, what? I was going to go to like Emerson or something like a really big communication school. But I didn't want to pay, get that much in student debt, like fifty thousand dollars. I can't pay that. Like, who who can pay that? I was like, you know, I want to go to start community college, then go to state school, then then see if I get like you know the lowest lowest um, out out there. When you were a high school senior, did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? Yeah, I did. You did, yeah. and that's what you went to school for. Yeah. Okay. Right. You were gonna say, John? Well, I mean, what these two kids had to go through to try to get their education, they you know. Um, they had to make a financial decision more than a decision. It was different when I was in school. You know, I graduated from school 30-something years ago. And uh, I think the most student loans, you get like 2500 bucks a year, and then you had to figure out the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But you weren't paying college professors 350000 a year to teach one class. Right. You know, the quality of education these guys got was much better than the quality of education I got. You might have just heard Elizabeth Warren's feelings with that statement. Well, too bad. And, and if you could do it again, well, it would really make beer. me happy. She can go have a beer. <laughs> But the, that's the problem. That that that's the problem. That's what that's what hurts. You know, kids from making choices of the schools they want to go to because of the the costs. It's well, everybody doesn't need the state of the art cafeteria, and everybody doesn't need a state of the art dorm room. But it's nice. But you know, is is do you have to pay for other people's you know retirement programs? And nice. I mean, my, my college room dorm was unrememberable and it, it was fine but you know, we didn't have exorbitant student loan debt you were gonna say I actually just graduated from Suffolk University as well congratulations um, I, I'm thankful enough to have the GI Bill so I got out with absolutely no debt whatsoever and one of the big selling points when I was joining the Army was you get the benefit of this GI Bill program you can go to college you can get a degree and you can leave with no debt and it's kind of like takes away from that agreement I made with the Army if we're saying, well, we're just going to do this for everybody else who didn't do any sort of service whatsoever for the country. The other quick point is, you know, we have banks that are willing to give 18-year-olds huge student loan debts, $100,000 plus to go and get a college degree in something that's not necessarily going to pay them in the long run, but they can't get any other sorts of loans like housing or, or anything else. And, you know, we, we do this with a straight face and we, don't, and we wonder why we have a student loan crisis. Brennan, let me ask you a serious question. Let's just say Bernie Sanders gets elected president of the United States of America. And three years from now, he says everybody goes to college for free, but you still, at that point, still have ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000 worth of student loan debt. How are you going to feel about that? I'm going to be feel pretty left out, you know, pretty left out. Like Do you I, think I that that's a reality? Yeah. No. What? I don't, no. Bernie Sanders is not going to get elected. I'm going to say it right now. Today's June 24th, 2019, right? Donald Trump will be reelected. Okay. And you know why? And Donald Trump is not going to pay off student loan no, debt, right? No, he's not going to do that. Here's why. Three incumbent presidents have lost in the last hundred years. Only three. I can't count Gerald Ford because he wasn't really elected. Right. Right? So you had Warren Harding, who was uh, president during the Great Depression. Right? Didn't have a chance. The other two were Jimmy Carter and uh, George H.W. Bush. And the dynamic in those, both those elections were strong third-party candidates that knocked them out. You're not going to have that in this election. 
it was almost impossible to beat a sitting president. Yes. Everybody thought George W. Bush wasn't going to win. He won. Won pretty easily. Everybody thought Barack Obama wasn't going to win, and he won pretty easily. Mm -hmm. I, I see Donald Trump winning this uh, election fairly easily. Now, what about you, Todd? What if uh, student loan debt is paid off in the near future, and you know you, you don't benefit from that? Well, I mean, I was lucky enough to get the, the free ride, but I don't know. To me, it was I made a decision based on you know where I wanted to go to school, and that I made the fiscal decision, and now, that that was you know it would kind of knock that that out where I thought I made the smartest decision I could have made in that situation, whereas everybody else is now going to be going to you know UNH, which is like forty thousand dollars a year. I chose a place that I got a free ride, but it's ten thousand dollars a year at the most. Now you all saw the story where the, bil the billionaire paid off everybody's student loan. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people said, that, hey, that was a great story. I'm probably the minority. And I said, well, wait a minute, maybe that wasn't a great story. How many families out there had sacrificed and put stuff on the back burner to go ahead and pay for the child's education, and then they just find out four years later that maybe we didn't need to make those sacrifices? So, yeah, they all hit the lottery. So, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I got one question. This young Brian, right? Sam. 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 Brian. Go, Brian. Oh, Brennan. 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 All right. So, Sam, <laughs> you, you benefited from the GI Bill, yes. right? So, I think this affects him the most because if Bernie Sanders wipes out the debt and he gave up two years of your life, four years of your life? About four years. Four years of his life, serving, I mean, you're serving his country, served it well, but he paid for it. He paid for it from blood, sweat, tears, being Absolutely. sent all around the country, all around the world. The, you know, the ultimate in service is serving his country. Service. Yeah, absolutely. You know? So, he should be commended for it. We'll end this topic with, uh, you guys all familiar with the famous uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, quote? Mm -hmm. yep. Socialism is, is a great idea until you run out of other people's money. So, All right, our last topic on trending on Twitter is, show a little American pride, U.S. women's team in the World Cup. Thoughts? Todd? Well, uh, the U.S. had its first goal scored against it in the World Cup in general. That was the first goal. It was uh, Spain's. Throughout the whole thing, uh, I think they've beaten everybody. I think it was 13 nothing, then 3 nothing, and 1 nothing against Sweden. So, again, first goal scored. So, congratulations to those women. They did a, they've been doing a great job making us proud. John, what do you think? Well, I think it's their tournament to lose. I mean, they, they came under a lot of fire for scoring 13 goals and celebrating every goal like they won the Stanley Cup. But, um, was that wrong? Was that unprofessional? You know, when it gets to be ten to nothing, I, th I think you know you can kind of tone it down a little bit. But um, but you know if it goes to a tiebreaker and they it's it's decided by how many goals are scored. Right. Uh, they, but you know. when you're scoring thirteen, I mean no one else is going to score thirteen at all. So I mean you know one to nothing soccer games are high. You know, I call soccer ninety minutes of sudden death overtime. Yep. So the first team that scores wins. Brennan. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm happy that they're moving ahead. Uh, can't wait to see what's going to happen in the next game when they versus France. So that's going to be pretty, pretty intense. Yeah. And what about you, Samson? Team USA. There you go. Rock on. There you go. That's how I was going to end it. All right, guys, that wraps the first segment of our Trending on Twitter. We're going to do it every week. So just check back with us on Trending on Twitter. And we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back here on Good Night, we're going to have a very interesting interview with Samson. He's going to tell us about the, go ahead, plug it. Infamous, super happy, fun American straight pride parade. Right here on Good Night. Welcome back to Good Night. We're going to get a little serious here because I think we have an important interview that we're going to talk about. We've got Samson Rachapi here tonight from the Super Happy Fun America. And so you are planning, you are an organizing. Yes. Infamously known as the Straight Pride Parade in that Boston, is correct. right? Yes. All right. So let's get the difficult question first out of the group. Is your group an anti-gay group? 100% not. Absolutely not. Uh, we are a pro-straight organization. We have nothing against those who live non-traditional lifestyles, and we actually have a, um, a gay liaison um, named Chris Bartley. He's working with our LGBT allies, and we also have uh, Milo y Yiannopoulos right. um, as our Grand Marshal. He's a very famous um, gay conservative speaker activist. All right, so let's dig in a little bit. So you're here tonight to say that 
your parade is not an anti-gay event. I'm here to say a whole lot more than that. It's, okay. it's unfortunate that the media is portraying this as a divisive us versus them thing because we believe um, we don't have to do our advocacy at the expense of some other group. You know, for example, um, the entire month of June is gay pride. Okay. Well, they don't go out into the streets and celebrate their pride at the expense of straight people. And we are going out and doing the same thing. We are, we are not anti any other group. We are just advocating on behalf of straight um, advocacy issues. In preparing for this interview today, you know, I did some Google searches. I did some Twitter searches. There are other people calling the group a white supremacy group. You're it's terrible. Okay, let's talk about it. Well, um, I, I'm an activist. Uh, you may have heard about the free speech movement that's been happening in this country for the past couple years. Um, I was involved with that big one that happened on the Boston Common in August 2017, a week after Charlottesville. The free and speech rally? The free speech rally. Okay. And I, I, like everybody else, was watching the free speech movement play out on TV. And the way the media was presenting it was, you have these white supremacists and Nazis holding these free speech rallies, and you have these anti-fascists coming out and shutting them down. And every single time this happens, there's violence, there's property destruction, and as an observer from home, I want nothing to do with either one of those sides. But I do know how the media lies to get their agenda pushed through. When I heard that there was going to be one of these rallies in the Boston area, I wanted to go see for myself what the truth was. And it turns out they're just a bunch of conservative and libertarian activists who are talking about pro-constitutional, pro-free speech rights, and they're being labeled and lied about as if they are these bad hate groups. All right, so you're saying that the genesis of this was the free speech rally a couple of years ago on Boston Common. So you, and it, you know, paint the background of the story here, because uh, so you and a couple friends got together and just said, well, in, what in do this, we want to, I mean, how, how did we get to where we are today? Sure, um, the, the straight pride parade, you know, everybody has talked or joked about having one of these uh, nearly every year. Somebody brings up, oh, oh, maybe we should have a straight pride parade. And this time around... Uh, your group of friends? or My group of friends? I've, I mean, I've heard, I see it on social media, things like that. Um, and somebody, John, John Hugo, the president of our group, and our vice president, uh, Mark Sahady, he's an Army veteran, captain uh, in the Army, deployed overseas. They said, well, geez, maybe we can create one of these actual straight pride parades and try to fight back against this agenda that's been pushed uh, against us. For example, let me, let me speak to that real quick. We, the left likes to use this language of diversity and equality and inclusiveness. And in the meantime, all those words have been weaponized and used against us. They, they, it's portrayed, if you don't vote Democrat, you're not diverse, you're not inclusive, you don't believe in tolerance. And so the idea with our movement is we're gonna take all those words, we use them as part of our advocacy, and look at the backlash that we've received. We've been attacked by groups across the country. AOC has tweeted about us. Mm -hmm. Whoopi Goldberg on The View made some extremely heterophobic comments against us. They joked that we were all straight white men who were in the closet. We don't bring up race. We don't bring up gender. This has nothing to do with any of those things. 96% of men and women identify as heterosexual, yet there are no significant civil rights organizations who are speaking up on their behalf. We are, we're a legitimate movement standing up on behalf of traditional values. So what are you hearing from people? Uh, well, you see what happens on the media and the news. Okay. But I'm, I'm the grassroots organizer, so my position with the organization is to mobilize volunteers and to, and to help you know, develop talent, talent to make the parade successful. Um, as a result, I get all the emails that's go coming through the website. Mm -hmm. Vast majority are in support of what we are doing. There are people from all across the country who want to open up their own chapters. They want to have their own parades. Even, even people overseas, Germany, Europe, um, South America, Central America, there is so much support. It looks like this is going to be a nationwide movement, and we're building the infrastructure for that right now. So you're hearing some positive stuff from some, some demographics. You're hearing some yeah. negative stuff from some demographics. Oh, All, for sure. I'm an old white guy, happily married for a long, long time, not gay. Uh, but I never thought about having a parade. 
Sure. So how does it appeal to my demographic? Well, uh, like I said, we're we're not just uh, standing up and saying, you know, we're straight. We want to celebrate our straightness. We we are pushing back against this agenda that's been saying that, you know, the the values that you grew up with, um, which are universal to everyone in this in this country, are being threatened, and we are on the leading edge of pushing back against that agenda. So if you can stand with us and walk with us in the parade, we want you there. If you can't, then support us any way you can, whether it's by volunteering or getting some merchandise. But it should appeal to you uh, because it, it's clear that our values are being attacked. Um, the, the, just the, the constitutional things, the, the stuff that makes the United States the beacon of freedom and liberty in the world is being threatened. And there's no real significant counter to it. If you are a conservative, you are constantly on the defensive against the agenda. We don't really have any offensive arguments right now. Um, I believe that that's why President Trump was such a huge sensation. That's why he won the way that he did. Uh, the media attacked him relentlessly. I think that the majority of Americans, that ident they identified with that. They recognized how, how fake news the media is, and they supported Trump because of because of the way that they portrayed him. And our straight pride parade is being portrayed this, the same exact way, and I think that we're getting supporters in the exact similar manner. In just an attempt to be fair, because we're always gonna be fair here on Good Night and ask fair questions and people can make their own conclusions as they want. Your words, 95% of America is straight, okay? And you also said the conservative movement, but 95% of America is not conservative, fair? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. No, go ahead. This is not a conservative movement. Okay. Um, it, it is a pro, it, it's a straight pride movement. Uh, but I don't think that constitutional and American values are owned by the left or the right. Okay. These are universal to everyone who is in the United States. Uh, if you are a human being, you should not be prohibited from speaking your mind, from being able to defend yourself against threats, to being secure in your homes and with your body. Uh, there should be nothing partisan about that whatsoever. Okay. But for some reason, a line is being drawn. The left is, is portraying us as a bunch of, as you said, white supremacists and hate mongers. And it's the conservatives and the, and the people on that side who are standing up and, and understanding what we are doing here. All right, so let's talk about the name of your group. So once yes, again, say it. Uh, it's the Super Happy Fun America, because we are a Super Happy Fun American group. How did you guys come up with that name? Uh, this is actually pretty genius. You know, uh, our founder, John Hugo, we were, we're, if you check out our website, superhappyfunamerica.com, you'll find a whole bunch of really comical, and uh, we're taking the language of the left and we're parodying it, weaponizing it, and flipping it right back around at them. And so we anticipated this to be a viral movement, um, and to, it was going to be reported by all sorts of uh, pundits across the country. And we knew that they were going to portray us in this negative manner with all this fake news. And in the process of reporting, they're going to have to say our name, Super F Happy Fun America. And it's, it's just this contradictory nature of saying with a straight face that these terrible white supremacists by the name of Super Happy Fun America are creating this straight pride parade. So it's, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. So you guys are trying to have a little bit of fun with this, but you also, you know, are taking oh, it's, this seriously. It's absolutely serious. Now let me ask you a question, because when I watched John Hugo on Jesse Waters on Fox, I was, I'll, I'll say it in my words, I was stunned that you guys have Milo as your, right, as your, uh, what is he, your? Uh, He's the Grand Marshal. Grand Marshal of the parade. Yep. How, how do you get to Milo? I mean, talk about a lightning rod of a person to have as a Grand Marshal of the Parade. Describe the process for people. Well, you may have heard about our original mascot that um, we, unfortunately, due, a, due to a scheduling conflict, we could no longer have him. Um, I don't know if you heard about the no, controversy. No, please tell the audience. Uh, I, I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to say his name at this point, but okay. we, we did pick Brad Pitt as our mascot, and unfortunately, he was unable to make it. Um, his attorneys notified us in writing that he is not going to want to be a part of our movement and so as a result we were looking for a younger more attractive more um, somebody who's more receptive to what we were trying to do and Milo as I earlier just, you said right I'm a straight guy but is there a more attractive person than Brad Pitt so is, <laughs> you're saying Milo is more attractive than no Brad no, no. Pitt. okay uh, he's more in tune with heroic masculine virtues 
And he, he knows a lot about being censored. He's been attacked relentlessly by those on the right. He's been, sh uh, by those on the left. He's been shut down by Antifa just for going out and expressing who he is in public. He, he understands very much what we're doing. And, and he wants to stand with us. Even as a member of a non-traditional lifestyle, he, he wants to stand up for straight rights. But some people are portraying you, as we said earlier, as anti-gay. So you can understand why Milo would be a lightning rod for this type of thing, right from the start? Like, Milo's a controversial person, and you're, you're free to choose whoever you want, but you understand the controversy that comes with Milo, right? Milo, all right, so we're being portrayed as anti-gay. Right. You're familiar that, you're aware that Milo is a gay conservative activist who just got married to a, uh, another man. Okay. So how you know I don't it's hard for me to reconcile the this idea that we're an anti-gay organization I'm just with this gentleman as our mascot and our our the face of our parade. So you don't agree with the the Oh absolutely not. No, we are just a pro-straight organization. We are a you know, we're a civil rights movement. Okay. Um, we have quite an alliance between members of non-traditional lifestyles. We have a lot of LGBT members who are going to be marching with us in the parade. We only have very few criteria for um, excluding people. You have to be pro-American values, pro-constitutional values. Uh, let me see. You have to be pro-constitution, pro-civic nationalism. We don't want any globalists. And you have to, we don't want any racist, hate mongers, alt right. We, we don't, it's part of our mission statement that we're excluding these groups. Uh, the other thing we don't want is since it's a pro American, pro family values type thing, we don't want any lewdness or nudity. But if, if you want to have a float, if you want to enter a float and you're a member of the LGBT community, you are more than welcome to join us. Okay. Not, not you, but you know. Let's talk a little bit more about the process. You've been meeting with Marty Walsh, the mayor of yep. Boston, so as people watch this on the internet around the world. Marty Walsh is the mayor of the city of Boston. Yep. Initially, I think it's fair to say that he said, no, we're not, you're, you're not going to have the parade. Talk, talk a little bit about the, your discussions with Mayor Walsh. Oh, for sure. Okay, so there's a permitting process that you have to go through to get um, a parade approved. Um, and the, the process was gone through by our, our organizers uh, the parade route, uh, we're, we have an appointment on Wednesday to go meet with the city. We're pretty sure that the date's going to be set for August 31st. But part of the ceremony, we wanted to have a flag raising ceremony as part of it. Um, for the month of June, Marty, M Mayor Walsh um, flew an LGBT flag out front of City Hall. And, and it, nothing wrong with that. We figured it's a good celebration for the month of June because it's Pride Month. Uh, but we asked for the same thing, you know, can we fly our straight pride flag out front of City Hall just for a few hours as part of our cer ceremony at the end of the parade? And they sent us a pretty thick document that was clearly generated by their lawyers with a whole bunch of exhibits and things explaining why they don't have to let us fly our flag. But they're going to, uh, I don't think they can get out of allowing us to have a parade. They realized that it if it went to litigation, they'd probably lose. Um, so Wednesday, we have an appointment with the city. We should have the date set in stone from that point forth. Being a longtime elected local official, I know a lot about permitting and so forth. Uh, if you're going to have a parade in Boston, you're going to need to have police details, especially with a controversial subject like this. How are you guys going to pay for it? Well, we, we are asking for the same privileges and accommodations as any other parade that's held in Boston. Um, for example, we're looking for the same exact route as the Gay Pride Parade, not to mimic them or anything, just for logistical purposes, for planning and things. We figure the city is so used to planning for that parade that we could put the same policies and procedures in place for us. Uh, if, if those accommodations required nominal fees from the, from the Gay Pride organizers, we're willing to pay those similar fees. Uh, but for the city to approach us and say, well, we're going to make you pay all these other exorbitant fees when none of these other groups have to do so, we think that that's unfair, and we're, we're going to push back against that. Are you prepared to take this to court? Uh, we are looking for all the assistance we can get. We do have f fundraisers and things. We have some legal volunteers, but um, we, we are willing and able to go to court if necessary. But we obviously don't want to. We, we just want to have our day in Boston. Um, in peace without any issues from the city. And what's that day? Your, your uh, it's plan? August 31st. It's a Saturday. 
It is Labor Day weekend. Um, we figure because it's a Saturday, it will result in less disruptions to the city and traffic and things like that. Um, and because it, this will be after the college kids are in, are in the city, it might have a pretty good turnout from, from locals. Let's talk a little bit about the troubles that you said. You said before we went uh, live on this interview that you've had some problems with Antifa. Oh my, all of our organizers, every single one of us have, have been, um, ex have experienced very terrible things at the hands of Antifa. So people know, what is Antifa? Well, Antifa, they're a very anti-fun group and they're not invited to our straight pride parade. Okay, what um, are they? Just so they, the people they, who don't know. They call they themselves anti-fascists. Okay. They dress in typically all black. They wear masks in public and they, they turn up to shut down people like me from having a rally or event in public. We, we organize free speech rallies where we invite speakers to come out and just speak on whatever it is that they wanna talk about. We've extended invitations to these leftist groups to say, hey, use our platform, say your piece. If you don't like us, you know, say something about it. But Doesn't what the Constitution provide us the opportunity for free speech? The Constitution prevents the government from re restricting our speech. Okay. So in, in these anti-fascists, um, their, their answer is, is they're engaging in free speech by going out into the streets and shutting us down. Um, they believe that our presence is a threat to their community, and because we are threatening their community, they justify in their minds using physical violence against us. Uh, last August in Providence, we had a, we had a rally down there. Uh, it got shut down by these violent anti-fascist protesters. What was the protest in Rhode Island? Uh, we were doing what was called a freedom rally, and okay. it, it was just going to be a speaking event. We brought thousands of dollars of uh, sound equipment. We brought canopies and things, and these, these anti-fascist protesters, they destroyed our equipment. They destroyed the, the speaker systems. The police had to deploy uh, horse-mounted riot units. We have footage of a masked Antifa protester picking up horse dung and throwing it at us and the, and the police. There was one arrest made with that. After that, this group followed us to the Providence Place Mall, where inside, busy shopping day, all sorts of shoppers just going about their business, a, a masked gang of these people came up to us inside the mall, distracted me from the front, and hit me over the head with a bike lock. Just missed my spine, missed my carotid artery. We had court today, and the DA tells me that even though it's the second offense, his first offense was um, against a Trump supporter at a rally uh, a couple years ago. Even though it's the second offense, he's probably going to get off with no jail time. He may, he may not even have to plead guilty to anything. They may just file it, is what this guy told me. And your opinion on that is? Oh, it's ridiculous. Okay. You know, I, I'm not somebody who engages in vigilante justice, but this stuff goes on for so long People see it happening on the media time and time again, and somebody's going to take justice into their own hands. It's not going to be me, um, even the police. Now, is that worth having at the end of August in the city of Boston? Are you kidding me? If, okay. I mean, veterans like, like myself and Mark Sahady, who's received a lot of backlash as a result of organizing this parade, we were told after 9-11 the reason why we go and fight these wars in overseas countries is to protect our American values in this country. We do it in these other countries so we don't have to do it here. We get out, we serve our time, we come to the United States, and what's happening on our streets is we're getting literal terrorists dressing up in all black and they're engaging in violent terrorist acts against us. If there is a problem in this country that needs to be addressed, it is these violent protesters. If we organized a parade and there was no backlash whatsoever and nobody cared, we would go have our day in Boston, we'd walk through the streets, we'd have our ceremony at City Hall, we'd go home, and probably next year we wouldn't have another one. But since we have such a backlash, it's an indicator to us that this is something that needs to be done in our society. All right, so let's talk about that. September 1st, you guys all get together after the parade, successful parade, there's no violence or anything. What do you guys uh, view as you know, a successful parade? What, what in your mind? For me, a, successful, uh, a success, no matter what happens, if we show up on August 31st and there's a thousand people who want to march in the parade and they're able to do so without any sort of interruption from, the, from these violent agitators, that's great because we were able to, to demonstrate and be who we are in public. If we have a, a thousand pro, uh, parade floats and people show up looking to participate and they get shut down, it's going to happen live on TV. There's going to be a lot of media reporting and people at home are going to see the truth of what's happening in the United States, hopefully. Um, I, I wouldn't view that as a win, but it's not a loss. 
The only way we can lose is if nothing happens on August 31st and we're not able to have any sort of events whatsoever. So you're going to say you, you'll know by Wednesday if this is a, if this Absolutely. is a real we're, thing. I mean, we're, we're moving forward with August 31st, um, but it, it may be pushed off a week or something, but we're moving forward with some sort of event. All right. So we've only got a minute or two left here on good night. Sure. Once again, you know, we're, as I said, we try to be fair yeah. to everybody. Plug the event. Let, let people know how they can learn more about the event. We're, we're taking back the public square. That's one of the big things about this. Um, you know, we've taken the language of the left. We've weaponized it, and we're using it uh, against them. Check us out on our website, superhappyfunamerica.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. If you want to get involved, you can email me, samson at superhappyfunamerica.com. Only because he's a friend, John Hugo went on Kirk Menahan's podcast on Barstool Sports. Is that what you guys were looking for? That is, no, um, John, John was not expecting that at all. Okay. Um, I think he was a little disappointed because uh, we, we all heard of Barstool Sports and we, mm -hmm. we actually respect them quite a bit. Um, and so when, he, when that happened, I think he was a little put off. But uh, if, you know, I'll sp I'm speaking on behalf of myself. If Kirk wants to talk again, I'm, I'm happy to speak with him. Okay. I, th I think it was a good, uh, entertaining uh, uh, interview, and kudos to Kirk Minahan as he goes with um, Barstool Sports. And we'll plug his program as well, the Kirk Minahan Show on Barstools. I thought it was good, but anything, anything we missed? Uh, no, I know. I really appreciate you having us out here. It's going to be a, a lot for us to change the perception that the mainstream media is having. And, and so uh, independent media and conservative, conservative media is where it's at. You know, all that I hope for... Uh, is that you guys do it smart, you do it, you do it fair, you do it inclusive, uh, and nobody gets hurt. I mean, I 100%. think that that has to be the objective. P you know, people are going to either agree or disagree, and that's you know the great thing about life. Uh, but uh, you know, safety I think has to be paramount. So good luck to you. You'll let us know how you make out on Wednesday. Absolutely. You'll let us know as well, and we'll do a follow-up segment as well. Yeah. We don't protect speech so that we can all agree. We protect speech so that we can be safe to disagree. He's Samson Rachabi of the. Go ahead. Per, per. Super happy, fun America. And you guys make your decisions for yourself. We'll do a follow-up, and you're watching Good Night. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Good Night. Thanks for tuning in to Good Night for our season premiere. We hope to see you again next Monday at 9 p.m. for the latest in pop culture, our music history and trending segments, and hard-hitting interviews. That'll do it for us, and everyone have a good night.